Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the fourth webinar already in our series of informal webinars. Uh, my name is Koen de Koning. I'm an agricultural economist in the OECD Trade and Agriculture Directorate, working on food systems. Um, and we thought, so we're currently working on a project on environmental impacts along food supply chains. And while we were working on that topic, it became clear that there's a lot of new research, new data, new initiatives by civil society actors, by the public sector. Um, and a lot of that has been happening in just the last few years. So there's a lot of exciting developments. And we thought it would be useful to create these kinds of informal webinars, really just to share interesting developments uh, so people can learn from each other and can also get to know other people uh, who have similar interests. And this is already the fourth webinar, so many of you will have heard my little speech here already a few times, but for the newcomers, let me still uh, briefly explain a little bit of the format. So what we're trying to do is have a short webinar, a short presentation. So the first part of the webinar is 20 minutes of presentation, followed by five or 10 minutes of Q&A. And that sort of concludes the core part of the webinar. And then after that, the, the second part is purely optional. Uh, if you want to stay around, you're more than welcome to stay around, and then we'll have small random breakout sessions. And the only goal there is really just to connect people with similar interests so you can get to know each other. There's no agenda. There's no reporting back to the plenary afterwards. So once that is done, you can all just go on your, on your way. Uh, we just hope to connect people uh, with each other in that way. Um, in addition, if, if you have any questions or suggestions or you want to get in touch with people who you met uh, in this webinar, feel free to send us an email and we'll be very happy to, to, do, to do that. Um, we're also recording these webinars and then uh, posting them on YouTube. And so you will be seeing emails from me uh, with, with links to the recordings and so on. So um, that being said, let me start by introducing today's topic. So we had a, an interesting webinar on Monday uh, where Kun Bone of the Sustainability Consortium in Wageningen University was talking about new sustainability initiatives. And one of the things he was mentioning is that there seems to be a bit of a, of a shift of a, a turning point now where a lot of the new sustainability initiatives are focusing on measuring impacts rather than focusing on which kinds of processes people have used. And a lot of the impact measurements relies on a methodology known as life cycle assessment, which is a commonly used methodology for assessing environmental impacts of a product all along its entire life cycle. <clears throat> Apologies. Um, and that methodology is, is increasingly popular. It's increasingly common, uh, including for food and agricultural products. But there are some modifications or adjustments that you need to take into account if you really want to make that a useful tool in a food systems context, in particular because uh, issues of nutrition are, of course, very important, and it's not something that, that normally comes up for life cycle assessments in other sectors. Uh, so it's really interesting to see that, that FAO has recently uh, coordinated a project on how you can reconcile or bring together environmental and nutritional aspects of food and agricultural products in life cycle assessments. So there was a recent report on nutritional life cycle assessments on what the methodological options are. So we're extremely pleased that we actually have the, the two people, the driving forces behind that work here with us today. So I'm, I'm very happy to welcome Mariam Rezai uh, from the FAO regional office in the Near East and North Africa in Cairo, and Sarah McLaren from uh, Massey University in New Zealand. And uh, Sarah is a professor of life cycle management and director of the New Zealand Center for Life Cycle Management. Uh, she's also joining at, his, at what is probably a very unreasonable hour for her. So. Thank you very much for that. So um, as usual, we'll, we'll have a 20 minutes presentation. I believe you'll be sharing the floor and, and you'll be covering a little bit what is life cycle assessment and then what exactly is the nutritional life cycle assessment approach. Uh, and then after that, we'll have five to 10 minutes of, uh, of questions and answers, hopefully. Uh, Mariam and Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kuhn. Uh, Sarah, will you please share the screen? I am going to turn off my video because Cairo's uh, internet is not very reliable. Um, safe, okay. Well, so uh, thanks, thank you Kun for setting the stage uh, and good morning everyone. And thanks for joining this informal webinar. And uh, I'd like to thank OECD also for inviting us uh, as Kun was mentioning, uh, I am an agro-food industry and evaluation officer in FAO and uh, I am the project coordinator for the work we are going to present today. We will 
um, talk about an action research project that was started in 2021 on life cycle assessment for sustainable food systems, integrating nutritional and environmental assessment. Um, I will first talk briefly about the importance of the work for FL's food system transformation agenda, and uh, Sarah will dive deeper in the content of the study and the result and, and learning of the first phase. Uh, Sarah, can you please uh, change the slide? Um, so this is a very timely topic for FAO because uh, our organization is kind of embarking on this, uh, on this new strategic framework to achieve more efficient, inclusive and resilient um, and sustainable agri-food system uh, to meet the, the strategic goals that we have, uh, better production, better nutrition, better environment and, and better life, leaving no one behind. Um, next slide, please. We um, recognize that today's, uh, sorry, can you please change, change this slide? Thank you. Um, we recognize that today's agri-food system are falling behind in terms of their contribution to sustainability and SDGs. Um, recent estimate probably all of you uh, know about from FAO indicated that globally nearly 811 million people suffer from chronic hunger. And this has been further exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing situation uh, with the supply market. Uh, at the same, um, and uh, next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, at the same time, more than 2 billion people are overweight and obese. And uh, we know that healthy diet remains unavailable and unaffordable to more than 3 billion people. Next slide. Um, food system is also a major contributor to greenhouse gas emission and primary driver of biodiversity loss, um, over, over continuing or to overuse the fresh water for agriculture um, and uh, degrade soil. This is just setting the stage basically why this work is so important for us. Next slide, please. Um, the, okay, you don't need to decipher this. Um, this picture is just to show you that the complexity of the food systems uh, and the challenges we are facing have really resulted in development of multiple frameworks and definitions and methods to capture the interaction within the component of agri-food systems, as you can see, and linkages with other systems such as uh, health, energy, um, infrastructure. Next slide, please. So navigating, um, um, through this complexity requires neutral balance and science-based approaches and tools, which also enabled diagnosis of agri-food system problems and to design context-specific inter intervention and innovation, because we are really dealing with a wide range of uh, countries with different contexts, with different um, socioeconomic uh, level, and um, they are also like either impacted by, uh, by climate change or uh, you know, they're, they're contributor to, to, the, to the GHG. It also require uh, the, this, like to navigate this complexity, we also require robust data and evidence to build, build greater sustainability, to minimize trade-offs and also to ensure longer impact in our response to the country's needs. Uh, but also we talk about food system transformations, but it's more than that. It's, it's also ensure that this transformation we are looking for is happening at the necessary scale and speed towards sustainability, as we don't have much time left to 2030. Next slide, please. So there are increasing calls uh, through FO committees and member countries to accelerate efforts towards achieving this sustainable agri-food system that meets the dietary needs of population within the environmental boundaries. In 2021, UN Food Systems Summit provided also an opportunity for us all to discuss how to transform food, uh, food system, but more importantly, in line with national context and capacity. So there is no policy solution or one dietary guideline that fits all. This is important in particular when looking at environmental impact of various food items and their contribution to human health. And uh, this is when we started looking into the tools such as uh, life cycle assessment, which is often used by private sector, like producer, manufacturers, retails, consumer, and research and academia. We really wanted to tap on the potential of LCA to provide a reliable basis for um, assessing and comparing the sustainability in different contexts, also for policymakers. 
Um, however, as Kuhn was mentioning, these LCA methodologies have some limitations and often fail to provide uh, sufficient guidance, guidance about environmental and nutritional impact. Uh, that users should capture when comparing the overall sustainability and health impact of, uh, of different food products. So how to deliver, how to decide how a policymaker can decide on what is best in terms of healthy diet um, if uh, the country is also uh, facing the uh, natural resource degradation or the, there's a huge uh, amount of uh, uh, poverty and, and inequality. So how, you, how do you really manage this trade-off? To respond to these issues, uh, Phil started this action, action research project, aiming at uh, first identifying the key LCA methodology limitation, uh, which restricts the ability of policymakers and food system actors from capturing and comparing the environmental and nutrition impact of food item, but also propose the ways to develop a more robust, multidimensional and comparable environmental and nutritional LCA methodology for uh, food items. Um, and, uh, and lastly, to also gain international recognition and uptake for a multidimensional LCA approach to measure and compare environmental and nutritional benefits within and across food systems. So we are now in collaboration with Massey um, University. Um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, I forgot to say that you should change this slide um, the, to slide uh, nine. 10, please. Yes, and I've already uh, presented this. So the other slide, yes. No, the, the next one. Um, we are now in collaboration with Massey University uh, to design the next phase of the project to include also the social and eco uh, economic dimension of diet, uh, including aspects related to accessibility and affordability. Um, and we hope that overall outcome will be a comprehensive set of practical guideline and quantitative and qualitative tools and methods to support policy making in improving sustainability of their food system to also deliver a healthy diet. We also believe that this work will be a great contribution to FAO's work, FAO's effort in promoting science-based approach to assess the impact of decisions and intervention on communities, environment, economy, health, and also it will contribute to moving this agenda of transformation of food system that is now at the top of everyone's agenda um, at, in different sectors. So now I'm sure you are all uh, very curious to know more about the content of the report. It was just to set the scene and see the, how, why this, uh, this report is so important for us. Um, and uh, so now we are going to really look into what we learn and what's, uh, what is in the making now. And uh, Sarah will talk about it. Uh, so over to you, Sarah. Great. Thanks very much, Mariam. So um, I'm going to give you an overview of what we covered um, in what we're calling phase one of the project, which was the work that Mariam talked about that took place last year. And we're now moving on to phase two. <clears throat> so the output of phase one was um, this report. Um, and its aim is to provide a guide on nutritional and environmental LCA for food items that's done in an accessible way, not necessarily just for experts in LCA and nutrition. Okay, and it's building on what we know at the moment about best practice. Um, and I'll give you the um, the overview of some of the things we talked about, but there unfortunately isn't a lot of time to go into the details. Um, indebted to everyone who participated in the project last year, there were 30 nutritional and environmental life cycle assessment experts who co-authored the report. So for those who aren't very familiar with life cycle assessment, um, it consists of a, a quantitative model, which is shown on the left here, where we assess the environmental impacts all the way back to extraction of raw materials through manufacture, use and on to end of life management. And there is a procedure that accompanies that that extends from goal and scope through inventory impact assessment and on to interpretation of results. Um, 
and we uh, were focusing on um, LCAs for um, food items in this particular project. So LCAs of food items have quite a long history going back to the early 1990s. The report on the right was one of the early guides to doing LCA for um, well, agricultural systems and um, onto the final food product. And since then, it's the studies have expanded into looking at diets and also looking at life cycle assessments where um, nutrient is a more um, kind of upfront part of the life cycle assessment. Um, but there's been issues because there's lack of agreed methodology on some aspects of how you assess nutrition <clears throat> in the context of LCA. Um, which leads potential to potential for misrepresentation of results. Um, and also there are issues when you go from assessing individual food items up to the dietary level and um, how, how you should go about doing that. So the first thing we looked at was terminology for doing these types of studies and agreed on the term nutritional LCA or NLCA where the nutrition is one of the main um, functions that are being investigated in the study. Um, use of a unit of analysis which is based on nutrition is going to be called a nutritional functional unit and um, the possibility of having an impact category um, which is focused on nutrition. So we're calling that a nutrition impact category. Um, okay, so there were some key questions that we addressed in the report. What's an appropriate functional unit when you're doing an, L an LCA? How do we assess the nutritional value of food items? Um, what's the, um, 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 where in the LCA procedure do we actually assess nutrition? Is it upfront as part of the functional unit or is it at impact assessment? And do we need to develop LCA methodology further in order to be able to do um, LCAs um, to support decision making in this area? So I'll go through each of those questions and just kind of give an a, a idea of, of what we have to think about and you can go and look in the report um, afterwards if you would like more details. Um, so functional units, functional unit could be a quantity of a particular nutrient, a measure of nutrient density. Um, can we look at quality corrected um, functional units based on nutrition? Um, and what about other aspects such as energy content? and how do they get expressed in the um, uh, LCA study. Question two, um, thinking about the nutritional value, um, there's an issue about nutrients to encourage and nutrients to limit. Do we look at all of them or just nutrients to encourage? How do we account for the bioavailability of nutrients and interactions such as those that occur with the food matrix um, and so on. Um, there's also this issue about context dependency um, in um, uh, nutritional requirements. Um, how do we account for that? And what about other aspects that are important in nutrition uh, besides essential nutrients such as dietary fiber and so on? Um, question three, um, which is uh, very much a kind of LCA geeky question, is about um, measuring um, nutrients or nutritional value in the functional unit or at impact assessment. So we've left open the possibility of doing either. Um, and that's for um, a bit more investigation in future. Um, but we have provided a um, decision tree to help people decide what's the most appropriate functional unit when they're doing a uh, nutritional LCA. And you can see that the left half of the diagram is all about the goal and scope. So how you set up your LCA study. So it's going to be useful to support decision making. And then question four, what do we need to further develop in LCA methodology in order to make it more um, 
applicable for nutritional LCA studies. And there's a number of um, methodological issues we've identified. And we're also very interested in that idea about how you um, fit LCA with a particular decision context and how that interaction works. Um, and we also picked up an issue about um, where you set your system boundary for a study and if you don't set it at the point of consumption, so maybe if it's at the point of the retail sale of the product, how do you account for the fact that the nutritional value of the product might change once someone takes it home and um, prepares it. Okay, so that was last year's project and what we're doing moving into phase two is um, looking at jumping up from the level of individual food items to actually look at different diets and how we um, as, as support decisions around diets. And this is a conceptual idea um, we've got at the moment about how to organize the project. And you'll see that yellow lobe there is focused on the NLCA. But what we want to do is look at that in the context of wider sustainability assessment, the blue lobe, and also um, transformative change and the role of innovation, which is the purple lobe there. So we're going to be working with experts in those two other areas to look at the process of doing a nutritional LCA and extending it, as Mariam said, into that multidimensional um, type um, approach. And um, so just to finish, if you'd like to download a copy of the report, I've put the um, website here. We're still in search of another contributor for this phase two project who's a specialist in innovation and sustainable economic transitions. If anyone wants to volunteer who's on the call. Um, and we will be running a workshop at the International LCA Food Conference on the 11th of October, um, which you can join um, online or go in person to Peru, which is where it'll be held. Um, so we'd love if people would like to um, come and participate and um, feedback their thoughts on where we've got to by October. Thank you very much. Back to Cohen. Thank you both for this really interesting presentation. Um, we, it's nice to see that we have some time left for questions and answers. And while everybody is, is thinking of what questions to ask, I'll use my prerogative to ask the first one. Um, my first question is actually about uh, the role of waste in LCA, because we've been reviewing life cycle assessments on food um, for our project. And one of the findings that, that some of the reviews have pointed out is that quite often this end of life stage is actually forgotten in a lot of food LCAs. And uh, I think when you start thinking in terms of nutrition, almost automatically it forces you to take that into account in a more rigorous way than would otherwise be done. Is that correct? Is that one of the advantages, indirect advantages, that you actually end up taking a closer look at the issue of food waste at the household level? <clears throat> Shall I answer that, Mariam? Yeah, so um, in LCA, the analysis is um, built up around the functional unit and the functional unit is the useful service provided. So um, it might be, I don't know, a kilogram of um, some um, product, carrots or whatever. Um, but in defining that, you also have to account for any waste that might be produced in the process of getting the cooked carrot to you. Um, so necessarily you have to account for waste that occurs all the way along the supply chain um, associated with your final consumption of that one kilogram of carrot. So you would take into account automatically um, the waste. And that's obviously that's a kind of wasted resource because you've still got to produce all the um, fertilizer and pesticides and grow the carrots that then don't get eaten but end up as waste. Interesting, thank you. Let's see if anybody else has any questions. You could either type them in the chat or uh, you can use the raise hand button in Zoom as you prefer. So uh, one question that just came in on the chats that people directed to me is, um, 
there are some other studies that have tried to combine uh, or to look simultaneously at environmental impacts and nutrition. Uh, often they use some form of optimization algorithm uh, to, to calculate the, what is achievable sustainable nutrition. So the question is, how does the life cycle assessment approach differ from those kinds of optimization approaches? Um, yes, so um, you can use optimization and life cycle assessments. It's, it's um, not that common, um, but what you tend to do with a life cycle assessment is just to assess the um, environmental impacts associated with several products um, in a kind of static way, as opposed to an optimization approach. Um, Con, if I could, if I may jump in also uh, just to complement what uh, Sarah was mentioning is that uh, what we are aiming at is uh, to have like a, a collection of different tools and methodologies and we recognize that LCA is only one of these tools because um, we may reach to a level that uh, especially when we dig deeper into the social and economic impact of diets, um, uh, we may uh, come to a conclusion that, okay, LCA is just one of the tools, but uh, if you read the report, you see, um, for example, one of the issues that has been flagged is data scarcity. And, uh, you know, like the challenges of data collection um, for developing countries. So uh, we are aiming at reaching to the point to have like a, like a, like a set of tools um, I don't want to call it a toolbox, but uh, but set of tools and methodologies and approaches that the policymaker can really go and pick from and see how, like, if they have more qualitative data or they have more quantitative data and uh, however the context of that country or that policymaking is, uh, they can adopt these approaches um, or methodologies and tools. So I just wanted to flag that, of course, uh, life cycle assessment is a very promising tool. That's why we started uh, to look into, it has a lot of untapped potential, uh, but we are not limiting uh, the, our quest for tools and methodologies. And we are hoping that this next phase mm -hmm. and the complementary studies that are coming out kind of also point us at um, a few like the, the indica indicators and, and what is missing and what are the limitation and some complementary tools. Yes, Ronin, go ahead. Thank you, Kun. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I can clarify because that was my question that you asked just now. Uh, maybe I can clarify a little bit because um, what 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 would be the aim of such an analysis? Is the aim to to say something about uh, the nutritional quality of a product together with its environmental impact, but remain at the product itself because I'm, I'm having a hard time to to look at how nutritious and sustainable a product is without considering the context of the whole diet <laughs> yeah okay um it, yes that's a, ve a very good point and in fact when we started out last year um, we did contemplate whether we should look at the dietary level, but decided it would be easier to start with the food item level, recognizing that it's actually pretty challenging to assess nutritional value of a food item without considering it, as you say, in the context of the whole diet. So I think that's a really good question, but also recognizing that um, if you're assessing a diet, then it's comprised of individual food items. So if you can collect data at the individual food item level, then you can kind of um, compile it together um, at the dietary level. Um, and in terms of um, what you're assessing, so LCA traditionally, well, the, the point of LCA is to assess the environmental impacts associated with your product system. Um, so that has usually been done in terms of what are the environmental impacts associated with, say, a kilogram of carrots or a portion of meat or something like that. Um, but that doesn't represent the nutritional value, which obviously is very important for 
food. Um, so can you define the functional unit? Um, what's being delivered in terms of that nutritional value is the question. And that's being done, for example, looking at delivery of a certain quantity of protein using different foods, but then you're only looking at one particular nutritional part. So how do you account for all those other aspects of nutrition if you're trying to um, uh, uh, work out what the appropriate functional unit is? So that those are the kinds of questions we've been looking at. That's very interesting. I was just wondering, um, that must then also be related to the decision whether you want to go for a nutritional functional units versus using nutrition as an additional uh, impact category, right? Because if you, I imagine if you have it as an additional impact category, you could have several ones where it's proteins, calcium, vitamins, etc. And then that would probably allow you to actually use it as an input in an optimization to calculate diets that sort of reconcile nutrition and sustainability. Yes, yes, exactly. And then what's your functional unit? And if you're looking at diets, then that's kind of more obvious. But if you're looking at food items, then maybe it's a, a typical serving size might be uh, appropriate functional unit. Yeah. Interesting. Ellie, do you want to come in with a question? Hi, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I'm wondering how you determine what a diet is, um, because in part of our um, work uh, in uh, the OECD, we've been looking at what countries know about what their consume, um, people, their populations, what governments know about what their populations actually eat. And um, we see uh, that there is, uh, many countries don't know what their, uh, what their uh, populations are eating. The surveys are very uh, expensive and there is the, um, they're not run very often or often enough. So I'm wondering, can you please elaborate on what is a diet? Great question. Mariam, do you want to start with that? Yeah, um, no, sure. Um, thank you. It, it's, it is, I mean, um, at this point, it just I want to also remind everyone that we started this work last April and we, are, we have now more questions than answer, <laughs> but we are moving towards having more answers. Uh, but uh, one element that we are looking at, we are um, because this work is being done and led by uh, by us, like the food system um, part of FL, but also in collaboration with other colleagues from from different divisions. And one of the major division we are looking, we are working with this nutrition division. And uh, as you know, uh, now there are uh, dietary guidelines. For, for all the countries, like most of the countries, FAO has a dietary guidelines. And the, our colleagues are really um, working with the governments to improve that exactly for the reason that what, what is the dietary basket? What is the food basket uh, that it can be, it can lead to a healthy diet and also, you know, like ensure sustainability. Um, it's a work ongoing within FAO, but, but we already have quite a bit of quite a few countries uh, that they have actually, you know, like we have information about their uh, their diet and the. Um, but then, of course, we also, as we go ahead for the with the next like this phase that Sarah is uh, now working on. Um, it's, it, it involves like further consultation and further look, like digging into these questions that, that you are mentioning because uh, we are really, the challenge not only and then the background of the kind of food that they are, uh, um, they are um, using, they're consuming because uh, food has roots in culture and in the sensory palates and you know how do you capture those in in setting the and these are kind of a, a very um, subjective you no know, like the value that can you cannot capture with data with diet but you, you have to be mindful and that's why it's, it, these tools have to be very context uh, have to have the be, have to be agile and flexible to be used in different contexts but just the, sh the short answer to the question, as I said, is that we are looking at the dietary guidelines being uh, worked on and produced. Thank you so much. I see it's 10:36 uh, now, so it's probably a good time to wrap up this first part.
uh, of the, the informal webinar. So thank you very much, Mariam and Sarah, for your excellent presentation and the interesting, uh, the interesting questions and answers here. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up this first part, uh, so we can also stop the recording at this point, I think.